Today we're going to talk about breastfeeding, which we've already mentioned in the growth and development course, but we're going to go in a little more depth on um, a variety of subjects, including the um, breast, the uh, baby-friendly hospital initiative, and we will also talk about things like um, how nutrient content of breast milk is affected by maternal diet. We'll also talk about some practical ideas on how to support breastfeeding and discuss the more common problems with breastfeeding and how to address them. So first of all, by way of review, it's important to recognize that according to the AAP and the Academy, human milk is the preferred source of nutrition for all infants, including premature and sick newborns. And the U.S. Surgeon General, who's currently Regina Benjamin, stated in a recent document released, which kind of reaffirms the importance of breastfeeding, she says, for nearly all infants, breastfeeding is the best source of infant nutrition and immunologic protection, and it provides remarkable health benefits to the mother as well. So we have multiple groups um, responsible for protecting public health, reaffirming that breast milk is not just a little bit better, but definitely heads and shoulders better above formula for um, protecting health. Now that is not to say that when a mother isn't able to breastfeed successfully that she should be made to feel guilty about that. But you know, the past history of breastfeeding in the US was that um, the formula companies and um, scientists even promoted uh, formula as a more scientific way to feed infants. And so breastfeeding rates really took a dive in the earlier part of the 20th century. And so what public health officials are trying to do now is to get people out of the mindset of thinking of breastfeeding as abnormal and trying to make breastfeeding the norm and formula the thing we do when we can't achieve the um, norm. Um, and I guess part of the consequence of that is, yes, some people will feel bad or will feel guilty or will feel pressure if they aren't able to breastfeed successfully. Um, but I think... From my perspective, I don't think as health professionals we can um, promote them as equivalent in good conscience because they aren't. Um, what we can do is handle individual mothers making this decision um, with care and recognize that we need to support them in whatever decisions they make so that they can get the best possible outcome for their um, newborn. All right. So some of the benefits of breast milk, of which you're well aware, are for the mother, it reduces risk of maternal diabetes, and it also reduces risk rates of certain breast and ovarian cancers. And we also know for children that it has a number of benefits, including reducing the likelihood of allergies, asthma, atopic dermatitis, upper respiratory infections, colds, ear infections, also known as otitis media, and in the um, preterm infants, things like necrotizing enterocolitis, um, later on in life, we note that infants who are children who are breastfed have lower rates of type 1 diabetes, of ALL and AML, they have lower infant mortality, they have improved cognitive function, and it also may reduce risk of overweight and obesity. And the document that I'm having you read for this course um, from the American Academy of Pediatrics goes into detail about the risk reduction that occurs with um, breast milk for these various conditions. And the reason, or part of the reason, that breast milk is so protective is because it has a number of immune properties which actively um, fight um, infections, so bacteria. So we have secretory IgA, which is active against E. coli, IgM, which is active against CMV, IgG, which is active against rubella and RSV, and so together, these make a kind of formidable offense against the kinds of illnesses that can negatively um, impact um, young children. We also know that there's lysosome present in breast milk, and so that is kind of a bactericidal or bacteriostatic um, compound that kind of breaks down um, any bacteria that are present in the breast milk. Now, the other reason we think breast milk is so um, good is because it actually contains live bifidobacteria. More than 700 species have been identified that can be present in breast milk. 
but um, because of that sort of bactericidal property of the lysozyme, they tend not to grow out of control. It kind of keeps those um, bacterial species to um, just a few. Um, and then the enzymes that are present in breast milk help with digestion in the neonate that has sort of a somewhat immature digestive system. There are also a number of growth factors, epidermal growth factor, which is kind of a growth permitting agent in breast milk, um, which may help to stimulate the intestinal mucosa to grow, um, and that in stre strengthens the mucosal barriers to antigens, and then you have the human growth factors 1, 2, and 3, which help to stimulate DNA synthesis and cellular proliferation, and then IGF, which also has a growth promoting role, and then finally CCK, or cholecystokinin, which enhances digestion and that feeling of satiety. So, you know, human milk really is the preferred food for all premature and sick newborns. There are a few rare exceptions. For instance, infants with galactosemia, where they can have no galactose, will not tolerate breast milk because the major carbohydrate source in breast milk is lactose. And, you know, one component of lactose is galactose. Um, but in most cases, it's the preferred form of feeding. And what that means is that we need to consider it normative and not something that is easily pushed aside. So for example, if a baby's hospitalized for a medical problem, as long as that medical problem doesn't interfere with their ability to breastfeeding, we really need to be cautious about saying stop breastfeeding formula feed um, because really that, that's a risky practice. It interferes with that successful mother um, infant dyad. There are a lot of varieties of support for breastfeeding. One is um, hospital support. Um, you can also have support from professionals. Um, so that might be the child's pediatrician or family practice physician or PA. It might be a lactation consultant, a dietitian. Um, there are a number of people who can help support breastfeeding. Mother-to-mother -mother support is also very important, particularly because, you know, a mother might be the first in her family to nurse, and so she might need another peer outside of her family to help her um, breastfeed successfully. Legislation is important, and also infrastructure. Do we have facilities and services that make it comfortable for women to breastfeed? Um, one type of hospital support is the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, and that was sponsored by the World Health Organization and UNICEF. And to achieve um, baby-friendly hospital status, the facility must meet the 10 steps. Um, so, you know, you don't have to have a large hospital to be baby-friendly. You just have to be willing to meet these steps. So you have to maintain a written breastfeeding policy, and then you have to go a step further and make sure that that's communicated to all healthcare staff. That would include physicians who have privileges at the hospital, it would include nurses, it would include even, you know, techs who might take care of the infant so that they wouldn't be giving bottles or pacifiers to babies who were supposed to be breastfeeding. You also have to train all the healthcare staff in the skills that they need to implement the policy, inform the pregnant women who come to your hospital about the benefits and management of breastfeeding. They have to help mothers initiate breastfeeding within one hour of birth. So that really means rather than, you know, quickly whisking the baby away to be weighed and all those things, that they do a minimum of those kinds of activities away from the mother and then really give the baby to the mother right away so that they can start bonding and that the baby um, in those first few hours when they're receptive to suckling and have that strong instinct that that is rewarded. And then also to show mothers how to breastfeed and how to maintain their lactation. So if you have a NICU in your hospital, it's your responsibility to make sure that while that baby is not with them, that you provide them the support they need to maintain lactation. They also are supposed to not give um, infants who are in the hospital food or drink other than breast milk unless you have to. So for instance, some babies, let's say particularly babies who were born large for gestational age, or um, they were macrosomic, maybe more than 10 pounds because of gestational diabetes, those babies are prone to develop hypoglycemia because they've been used to kind of high levels of mother maternal blood glucose in the uterus. And when they are brought out of that environment, they may suffer sort of a reactive hypoglycemia. And so, you know, in that case, you might have to give that child a little bit of sugar water in order to bring the blood sugar up quickly. But 
there's also the practice in some hospitals of let's say um, an infant is simply um, not with the mother. Let's say the, the nursery workers have removed the baby from the mother's room for a little bit. They want to let mother sleep and the baby wakes up and seems hungry and they don't want to disturb the mother so very kindly they think I'll go ahead and give the baby a bottle so that mom can sleep. But what that does is interfere with her um, ability to nurse the baby, establish her lactation. So that's another part of the baby-friendly um, hospital policy is that the child should room in or be with the mother 24 hours a day unless it's necessary. Let's say the mother has to shower and there's no one in the room. Um, then the hospital would take the baby to the nursery. Um, they're also to encourage unrestricted breastfeeding, give no pacifiers or artificial nipples. And there's kind of an old concept of nipple confusion that a baby who's breastfed, who's given a nipple, will get used to that other type of nipple, which is very rigid and prominent and won't accept the breast. Um, but that's probably not true after lactation is established. So after anywhere from three to six weeks, the baby is adjusted to breastfeeding and then a pacifier is probably not a problem, but in those first few weeks it might be. And then also that they should establish um, breastfeeding support groups or refer mothers to them if, when they discharge them. In the U.S. there are 286 U.S. hospitals that are baby friendly and that's up almost 100 from what it was when I checked the statistics last year. In Texas there are 12 and that's up about 5 from what it was last year. And it's important to point out that North Texas really does the best here, that um, elsewhere in the state, including in Austin, which we think of as being our more liberal um, sister city to the south, there are actually no baby-friendly hospitals. But all of the THR facilities, except for maybe one or two in our area, are baby-friendly, along with Methodist. And Parkland, I don't know what their status is. In the past, they were working on attaining baby-friendly status, and I don't know if they've given that up or not, but they don't seem to have attained it yet. Um, some other means of hospital support. One would be providing you know, sufficient space that the women who are there in the hospital um, are able to pump. Also limit distribution of free formula, because if a mother is sent home with formula from the hospital, the sort of hidden message might be that we're encouraging formula feeding. And also, if that mother gets into trouble feeding her baby, you know, she's having trouble with lactation, she might kind of, in a moment of weakness, offer that free formula to the baby and they might like it and she might think, you know, this is fine, let's just do this. So, um, you know, not distributing free formula is really kind of important to help support maternal um, breastfeeding. And then also providing lactation support. It's ideal to have a lactation consultant or someone else from the hospital call to follow up on the mother one to three days after discharge to make sure that nursing is going well. Um, of course, getting the baby into the pediatrician within a week of discharge. Um, having supportive attitudes towards breastfeeding and then, you know, referring out when you have problems. One type of professional support can be through an IBCLC. Um, these board-certified um, professionals can be nurses, but they also can be dietitians or other professionals. I used to work with a PT who is an IBCLC, um, but most of the ones I've worked with have been nurses. And they can really just help to create and administer a lactation program or provide advice to the mother-infant pair. Um, they can educate other professionals, but to become an IBCLC requires a pretty hefty um, process, it's a thousand hours of clinical practice in lactation and breastfeeding within the five years prior to the exam, and then 90 hours of special education and lactation. So, you know, if you were working in a NICU and you had a lactation consultant who was willing to let you assist with that process, you could probably get those hours within five years, not too, without too much difficulty, but if you're not in that setting, that would be difficult to attain. Mother-to-mother -mother support is really important too. In the past, groups like La Leche were kind of the only um, support groups for mothers. And, you know, they've been a, a really important driver of breastfeeding, but at the same time, they've kind of gotten the reputation as being sort of breastfeeding Nazis. I'm sure not all La Leche groups are, but um, so some mothers are kind of scared off of those groups because they afraid, are afraid they will be too judgmental if they're not able to breastfeed. Um, 
WIC also has this wonderful program, the Breastfeeding Peer Counselor Groups. Those have been around for maybe, I would say, at least a decade. And they allowed, um, you know, women within WIC who successfully breastfeed to take on a peer advising role um, to other women who are pregnant. And, you know, many of these women have gone on to um, get paying jobs with WIC. So it has some um, benefits to the peer counselor as well as to the mother receiving the advice. In Texas, um, Section 165.002 of Texas law establishes the right to breastfeed. Um, this was conferred about 1995, and it says a mother is entitled to breastfeed her baby in any location in which that mother is authorized to be. Um, we know that women sometimes feel strangely about breastfeeding in public, and also people may be very judgmental of their doing that. But you have to remember that um, in other parts of the world where that's the standard, the breast is not sexualized and it's not seen as a sexual object and so women aren't regarded in the same way for doing this thing. Um, it's really part of our culture that we see the breast as something that belongs in the bedroom instead of something that allows us to feed an infant. The federal law, also there's this Fair Labor, Labor Standards Act, um, which says that women are entitled to a reasonable amount of break time and a space to express milk as frequently as needed for up to a year. Um, and that law um, should be really helpful, but yet there are, women will tell you that there are still many places of employment where it's very difficult to keep your job and support nursing. It's still one of the major barriers, barriers that women cite um, for successful breastfeeding. In Texas, we also have the Texas Breastfeeding Initiative, which is kind of a program um, within the state of Texas, which says that all programs that belong to the State Department of Health should promote and support breastfeeding. Um, it's kind of a movement to um, encourage the medical community and hospitals to be baby friendly, to encourage the business community to become mother friendly. Um, to make sure that schools like universities include breastfeeding in their curricula for doctors and nurses and dietitians and social workers, um, to try to get insurance to reimburse for lactation support, to teach breast is best in health and parenting classes, and so on. So how does breastfeeding work? Well, the lactating breast, um, the average size is 200 grams, and in pregnant women, it's almost two to three times that. And then, then in the lactating woman, it's even larger. However, even though, yes, the breast does grow when you are pregnant and, lact and you're lactating, the beginning size of the breast does not affect a woman's ability to breastfeed successfully. Now, a woman who became pregnant and gave birth and the breast size did not change, that woman might not be able to success to breastfeed successfully because it could be a sign that the hormonal factors are not in place to allow her body to make that transition. But as far as small breasted women who are getting pregnant, they needn't worry that they won't be able to nurse. What matters to nursing is whether you have enough glandular, functional glandular tissue there to produce milk. Um, so as um, a woman proceeds through pregnancy in the first trimester, her breast tissue begins to change. In early pregnancy, she, she made it notice that her nipples darken and the little glands on the surface of the nipple kind of become prominent. And then midway through pregnancy, she may really notice that her breasts have enlarged and she has more fat deposition and these lobules that can be felt underneath the breast tissue. And then some women actually may have a little bit of leakage of milk from their breasts, which is normal, um, but most women don't. Most women, the, the Expressing in milk doesn't happen until after um, delivery. In terms of hormones, you'll remember from growth and development that prolactin stimulates milk production and that suckling stimulates prolactin. So if you want a woman to be able to nurse successfully, that's why you want the baby to be at, at the breast early and then as often as they need to to stimulate production. And then oxytocin is the hormone that's important to allow for letdown. So that's when the milk is actually ejected. So when either the pump or the baby is applied to the breast and they're putting pressure on the nipple and the nipple is extending and becoming longer, as that goes on, there'll be a period of time where there's really no milk being expressed and all of a sudden the woman will experience this little bit of tingling and kind of a release and that's when the milk is let down and starts coming into the baby's mouth or into the pump. 
Now, the other function of oxytocin is that it shrinks the uterus. And so when a woman's had a baby, her uterus is kind of large, oversized from having that baby from being stretched. And to get it to go back down to a normal size so that mother doesn't continue to look pregnant, it has to shrink. And oxytocin stimulates that shrinkage. That process is actually painful. Many women aren't prepared for that, but it's like can be like severe menstrual cramps as that happens and it actually occurs while nursing which can make nursing a little bit um, off-putting in the in the first week or so. Um, the other part of lactogenesis is that we have different phases of milk. So the very first milk that the mother produces which is lower in energy and higher in protein and higher in minerals and electrolytes and has kind of a different set of um, microbiota present than the later milk um, is only present for the first few days, so maybe one to three to up to seven days. And then the transitional milk comes in about seven to 14 days postpartum, and it's gonna be very rich in immunoglobulins and the immune properties and proteins, and it'll have a higher amount of lactose and fat and energy. And then about two weeks postpartum, the mature sh milk should have arrived, and that will continue up till the age of about seven to eight months. And then finally, beyond seven to eight months, um, up to about two years, there's kind of an extended lactation where the milk is quite not quite as rich in energy and um, minerals as the early milk. So colostrum, as shown in this picture, is thick and yellowish um, in the bottle on the left. Um, women produce small amounts, maybe less than an ounce per feeding. Um, and like we said, it's very rich in immunoglobulins, mononuclear cells, um, it's got some more minerals and protein. And then the transitional milk um, is, you know, something that comes in later on, you know, three to seven days, up to 14. It's got a lower protein content, the lactose content's increased, etc. And then finally, there's also something called preterm milk, and this is... I'm not totally up to date on the research behind preterm milk, but it's generally thought that it's only present in women who give birth to an infant who's less than about 26 weeks, and it doesn't last more than about two to three weeks. But it is higher in protein content, which a preterm infant needs. It's also higher in calcium and other minerals and lower in lactose, which also fits well with the preterm infant's needs. However, you'll find people who will think that, you know, we really should give preterm milk with nothing else added to it. And, and the fact is it's just not nutritionally adequate for the preterm infant um, who's very low birth weight or extremely low birth weight. And the reason is that in that final trimester that a preterm infant may miss all or part of, they get this last sort of infusion of minerals and fat soluble vitamins and they put on fat stores that get them ready for birth. And the preterm infant doesn't go through a part or all of that process and thus you know, a standard milk is just not going to provide them everything they need. In terms of nutrient content of breast milk, it's around 65 to 70 calories per deciliter, which equates to about 20 to about 20 calories per ounce, um, which is the same as formula. You know, formula is, is kind of based on breast milk as the gold standard. Um, now, the children's book, you will notice, says that the calories are actually 72 or 73 calories per deciliter, I believe, which is more like a 22 calorie per deciliter um, formula. Um, you know, various studies have shown different outcomes, but, you know, energy, the energy content of breast milk varies some from mother to mother, so when we choose a number, we're kind of choosing an average and we're assuming that that's what's in the breast milk. That doesn't mean that that's precisely what's in the breast milk. Protein content is 1.9 to 1.2 grams per deciliter, which compares to um, a standard infant formula has about 1.42 grams. And that doesn't mean that formula is superior to breast milk. What it means is that the, the protein that's present in um, formula is usually whey and casein, and that those proteins, those cow's milk whey and casein proteins, are not as well absorbed as the protein that's present in um, breast milk. Um, now in terms of how maternal diet affects the macronutrient content of milk, if mother temporarily has a low protein diet or if the quality of protein in her diet um, is not the best, it doesn't usually affect the protein content of human milk. Her body has the capacity to manufacture 
the proteins that are needed to go into that milk. But if she has a chronic um, maternal protein deficit, a very low protein diet over time or malnutrition, then her milk may have a lower protein content. Um, there's also, uh, it's basic, it's a fact that you cannot create a low lactose human milk by having mother have a low lactose diet. Um, the, basically, there will still be lactose in human milk regardless of maternal diet. That's the primary source of carb in human milk. Um, the fat that's in human milk is very much affected by diet. So if mother has a diet rich in fish or flaxseed or walnuts, then she may have a diet that's rich in EPA and DHA and ARA, um, whereas a mother that consumes a lot of Popeye's chicken may find quite a bit of trans fat in her human milk. Um, the fat-soluble vitamins um, can also be influenced by maternal diet or other factors, but they're not as influenced at, by diet as the water-soluble for obvious reasons. Um, when mother's manufacturing milk, she can draw on her stores in order to put the right amounts of vitamins in the milk. And so the vitamin D, you know, if mother has pretty good exposure to sunlight and doesn't have dark skin, or if she has a diet that's rich in vitamin D, or if she's taking a supplement, um, her vitamin, the vitamin D levels in her milk may be better than someone who has poor exposure or poor diet. Um, however, with vitamin D, it's much harder to say what the quantity is needed to get the vitamin D content of the milk to be adequate. And so uh, the AAP still recommends that all breastfed babies receive a vitamin D supplement to make sure that they get enough. And then um, vitamin A also um, in the milk can be affected by the quality and quantity of vitamin A in the maternal diet. Um, vitamin K is primarily produced by bacteria in the gut, and so when a baby's born, they initially don't have bacteria, but they get a transfusion sort of of bacteria, both from either a vaginal delivery or from whatever's in the delivery room if they have a C-section. Um, and then the breast milk itself, if they receive it, um, contains live bacteria, which helps to colonize the gut. But because that sort of transition time from when the baby is delivered and gets breast milk until they have sort of an intestinal microflora established takes a little while, it's still the standard of practice to give all infants a vitamin K shot at birth to make sure that they don't die of like a hemolytic anemia from absence of vitamin K. Okay. Uh, Water-soluble vitamins are more likely to be deficient in human milk than um, fat-soluble, but yet those clinical deficiencies rarely occurs in breastfed infants. B6 is probably the most likely to be deficient, and B12 and folic acid are bound to whey proteins in the milk, and so because whey isn't usually deficient, they're less likely to be deficient. However, I we've definitely recorded in the literature where deficiency of B12 can be a problem. Um, in the infants of women who've had gastric bypass, also in women who have hypothyroidism, also in vegans, and those who have pernicious anemia themselves. Um, in terms of minerals, you know, um, human milk is really relatively low in minerals, um, and so, but the minerals that are present are highly bioavailable. So if you look at a jar of formula and you compare that to the mineral content of human milk, you might think that the formula is superior, but really those higher mineral levels are present in order to get adequate absorption. Um, the nice thing about human milk is it's kind of the perfect renal formula. If you have a baby who's born with congenital kidney disease, breast milk is a lower mineral, um, more easily absorbable um, source of nutrition for those babies. Uh, maternal diet doesn't affect calcium content of breast milk much because if the mom doesn't have much calcium intake, well, then the calcium for the breast milk can be taken from her bones. And so that does give you a red flag though that you need to take care that moms do get adequate calcium or they may um, really be taking a bigger hit to their bones than they should. Okay, and the other point in terms of breast milk is that it is not sterile. There are more than 700 species of bacteria have been found in breast milk, um, and that may contribute to the probiotic role of breast milk.
There are a number of common problems that women who nurse may have. Um, sore nipples, letdown failure, hyperactive letdown, engorgement, plug ducts, infection and jaundice are some of these. Um, but to prevent them, we really just need to promote um, proper establishment of breastfeeding. And so part of that is that baby-friendly initiative of letting the baby go to breast as soon as possible after birth. Um, and when that happens, the baby first practices suckling and learns to latch, but also the baby um, has peristalsis stimulate with, stimulated within his or her gut. And so, you know, there's stool that's present with the infant's gut when they're born. The stool is called meconium. And if that meconium just sits there, what happens is the bilirubin that's present in the stool that gives it that you know, brownish color is reabsorbed. And when it's reabsorbed, it turns the skin kind of a, you know, an orangish brownish color. Whereas if you stimulate the gut to move and stimulate that, that stool, that meconium to pass early, the bilirubin is not reabsorbed and that decreases the likelihood of jaundice. Um, you also have, you know, breastfeeding engorgement is minimized or prevented when you have early access to the breast. And in order to prevent engorgement and to establish nursing and let the baby gain and grow the way they should, you want to allow the baby to breastfeed frequently on demand. Um, some mothers really, you know, swear by schedules for feeding, and schedules might work well with an older child, one who's at least more than two months old. But the very young infant, especially in those first few weeks, needs to be able to feed on demand if you're going to establish breastfeeding. So every two to three hours, and women with smaller breasts, they might even have to um, breastfeed more frequently, or if they're having a um, milk production problem, they might have to breastfeed more frequently. The other important tip is not to have the baby move to the other breast before they're finished with the first. So if the baby's latched and attached and sucking and swallowing, you don't break suction and switch to the other breast. Because if you do, there may be a significant amount of milk that gets left behind in the, in the breast, and that is called hind milk. The floor milk is the first milk, which is usually lower in, um, it's uh, higher in protein, um, richer in fluid, lower in fat, and so it's kind of a low-cal version of the breast milk. And if the baby only get, receives the fore milk and never gets the hind milk, they're never going to get the rich, fat-rich milk that they need for growth, brain development and to gain weight well. Oh, the image in the picture, the safety pin, is because that's a common technique for women to use to help remember which breast they started with last time, so the next time they put the baby to breast, they should start with the opposite breast from the one they did the first time. Um, you know, babies actually sometimes prefer one breast over the other, or maybe one's easier to nurse from, but you can't let them have their way there. They have to nurse off of both, or the mother can have some problems with um, nursing. These are some images taken from the Mayo Clinic website, which show various ways of nursing the baby. You can see that in each of them, the baby's head is higher than the rest of the body and the head is supported. And that's really the most important thing about a nursing position is that the baby's head is supported. They're able to get a breathe a little bit. You know, they're not smushed against the mother. And also, if they have a tendency to spit up or have reflux, that they aren't having that milk run back up their throats. Okay. Um, the C-hold and V-hold are just basically two ways of presenting the breast or the nipple to the baby. And you can see in the image that I have there, the mother's kind of cupping the breast. What she actually will want to do is kind of smush it a little bit and offer sort of a breast sandwich to that baby so that there is a nipple protruding just like there would be from a, from a bottle that the baby can kind of grab a hold of. How do I tell if the baby's getting enough? Well, if you can hear the baby swallowing and gulping and they're not, you know, coming back off the breast angry that nothing's coming out, if they're having six to eight wet diapers a day and two to three stools, which are usually kind of soft and yellow and mustard seedy looking, um, then they're probably getting enough. But if you have a preterm baby where the mother's very concerned about how much they're getting, you can do a pre and post weight. And so if a baby is weighed before and after a feeding and the baby's gained 30 grams, well 30 grams is about 30 mils, which is about one ounce, so they've only eaten an ounce. But if that same baby is weighed after the feeding and they've gained 240 grams, well that's about 240 mils, which is about eight ounces, so they've had a lot. Um, 
In terms of breast pumps, there are a number of things out there, but if the mother is needing to, let's say the baby's in the NICU and the mother needs to establish that milk supply only through pumping, a hospital grade pump, which is more than $1,000 is what's needed. Um, a woman who's gonna go back to work and is gonna work long hours may need an electric pump, whereas the woman who just you know wants to go out on the town and have a few beers with the girls and doesn't really wanna give the baby that milk, who might want to pump to keep her milk supply going, but then dump it, um, you know, that would be um, something she could do. And then here are some examples of what some of them might look like. Okay, um, you know, when the baby isn't able to breastfeed, let's say the baby does have to go to a NICU, you wanna start them pumping as soon as possible, and they need to pump every two to three hours. Um, not less than five times per day. Um, women who pump less than five times per day tend to have low milk supply. Um, and once during the night. Um, also, the mom shouldn't be um, you know, encouraged to crank it up on high to get more out. They need to use a setting that's comfortable. And when milk is first coming in, if let's say mom's pumping in the very beginning, let's say her baby's in the NICU, she should pump for 15 to 20 minutes and not much is going to come out, just you know, a few little drops of colostrum, but she should continue to come for the pump for those 15 to 20 minutes. But once she has a milk supply, her milk is quote, come in and you know, her breasts are full of milk, she needs to pump them until she stops getting milk out, and until her breasts are pretty soft, and then pump about one to two minutes after that to make sure that a second sort of letdown phase doesn't start up. Some common problems with nipples can be flat or inverted nipples, um, but even women with flat or inverted nipples can breastfeed. If the baby has trouble latching, she shouldn't do anything to toughen up her nipples or to change their shape. The breast shells and the things that people are given really um, probably don't work that well and can cause problems, um, but you can put a soft plastic sort of cover on the nipple that gives the baby something to latch onto and that can work. Um, it's common for women to have sore or cracked nipples, especially if it's their first time nursing or maybe the baby's a little bit premature or it, and so isn't getting a proper latch. But if that happens, um, women should just be, you know, encouraged to recognize that that's normal and they can allow a little bit of the express breast milk to dry on their breasts to help moisten them and they can use purified lanolin, but they shouldn't use all these other creams which might contain you know, alcohol or be irritating to their skin, and then they don't need to like sanitize their breasts before they pump or let the baby go to breast. They just need to shower once a day. Um, engorgement is basically where the breast gets very large and full of milk and the baby may not be able to latch. And you can use a warm compress. Um, you might encourage the woman to do shower and massage um, to help with comfort. Um, if she, you know, is having trouble even applying the baby to the breast or um, applying a pump because the, the breasts are so rigid, she could put a cold compress on it to kind of reduce the swelling for a minute. Um, and she could also use fresh cabbage leaves, but you have to be really careful with that because that can dry up the milk supply. Um, mastitis, as shown as the image here from the Mayo Clinic, is just a really, and it's an infection in the breast. And so that the mother with mastitis needs to get to her doctor right away so she can get some antibiotics um, because if the tissue in the breast is damaged by the mastitis, it can permanently affect her milk supply in that breast. So she needs to get to her doctor, and then she needs to continue feeding the baby so that she can you know, relieve the milk from the breast. And then she also needs to um, make sure you know, that she's keeping minimizing her risk factors. So taking care of any cracked skin with lanolin, making sure the breast is emptied all the way. You know, if she's had a plug duct, that can sometimes lead to mastitis. Um, but it's important for dietitians and other milk professionals to really know and understand breastfeeding. It's really not someone else's job, it's part of ours. Um, we do nutrition and the main physiologic way for babies and young children to be fed is by the breast and so we need to know about it. Um, there are a few things that might keep some women from breastfeeding. One might be if they were had cancer and were going through chemotherapy or radiation. Um, the mother who is actively taking drugs of abuse, and that's not just because the drugs are harmful to the baby, it's because a mother on drugs might not properly take care of the baby. Um, also drugs that suppress lactation. Um, Sudafed was one that you have to go get from the pharmacy now, but because it's a decongestant, 
like drugs that are decongestants that kind of dry people up, um, that dry up mucus, tend to also dry up lactation. Um, in terms of other exposures, nicotine, yes, can pass through the breast milk and it can make a baby quite sick. But it's still, if a mother is a smoker, it's better for her baby to be breastfed than to not be. Um, however, she should quit smoking. And then caffeine, large amounts of it especially, can cause fussiness and difficulty sleeping in the offspring. Not having ca caffeine can cause fussiness and difficulty sleeping in her, <laughs> cause fussiness in the mother. Um, and trouble staying awake, I guess the opposite. Um, alcohol um, does pass through the milk and the levels in the milk are related to the amount consumed by the mother. Um, you know, I mentioned pumping and dumping earlier. Um, you know, discarding the pumped milk won't help the baby. If you, if you discard the milk right then and then put the baby to breast in the hour after you've had something to drink, well, there's still going to be um, alcohol in the milk that you produce. But if you pump and dump to keep your supply up, let's say you're gone for several hours, and then come back with a normal blood alcohol level, um, that milk should not contain um, alcohol. Um, in terms of breastfeeding diet, it just needs to be healthful and well-balanced. Um, limiting caffeinated beverages, um, maybe you know some omega-3s to help with good cognitive development, so some salmon and such. Um, but there's no evidence that women need to avoid um, allergens during pregnancy, even if they have a strong history of, of, of food allergy in the family. And the reason for that is studies actually seem to indicate the opposite happens, that mothers on elimination diets trying to avoid um, allergies in their offspring actually have higher levels of allergies in their offspring than women who include those foods in their diet. Um, we also don't need women to arbitrarily, you know, restrict gassy foods or spicy foods unless they notice that the seems to bother the infant. And finally, they don't, they shouldn't eat a diet that contains less than 1,500 calories because if they do so, they're likely to have a decrease in milk um, production. They don't have to have, you know, gargantuan amounts of fluid either, but you know, if it's hot or humid out, yes, they need to drink plenty to keep up with milk production. And then vegans, um, you know, may actually have to plan carefully um, to make sure they're getting, you know, adequate and complete amounts of protein in the diet, adequate B12, etc. Um, mothers can breastfeed multiple successfully. I once had a patient who the mother was an ER doctor who had triplets and she was so organized, she just fed all three of those babies in an assembly line and didn't seem to think it was a problem. Um, but it may be more challenging for a mother to build a large enough milk supply to feed those multiples. Donor human milk is something that's been around a long time, um, but it's kind of had a resurgence in the last 15 years, so much so that, of course, people even buy milk online from other mothers or trade it, um, and that's really not recommended because you don't know the social status, the drug history, the disease status of the women who are providing that milk. But the women who donate to a milk bank actually um, are screened, and so they have to have blood tests to rule out a number of diseases. They have to assert and have a doctor assert that they believe the patient's free from risky behaviors. And then they can't take um, a whole bunch of medications. They don't get paid for donating. And they do need to have either a surplus or sometimes a woman who's had a baby die will donate the breast milk if the baby was in the NICU and the mom was pumping. Um, but to make sure that the milk is as good quality as possible, they pool the milk from three to five donors to make sure it's more homogeneous. They um, slow thaw the milk, um, which is you know donated in a frozen form, and then culture it and pool it and dispense it into three to four ounce bottles. And then they pasteurize it and quick cool it and freeze it at minus 20. And then even after they've gone through all this process, they furthermore culture it for pathogens and they keep tracking numbers on it just like they do for blood. So if something later grows, they can contact um, any hospitals that may, or mothers that may have received the milk to let them know there's a potential problem. Now the problem with pasteurization effects is that it really does decrease the vitamin intake a little bit, it doesn't change the mineral content, but it also um, decreases the immune properties and that's one of the main reasons we think we want breast milk is because of the IgA and of course the bifidobacteria and those aren't going to survive pasteurization. Um, some unknown factors involved with nursing, um, 
or with um, donor milk is we really don't know how effective it is at decreasing length of stay in neck, um, but we still, you know, feel like it might be better than formula because neck is, is such a high risk um, problem in NICU babies. And that is the end of our discussion.